Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're going to be talking about Attack on Titan, the anime. So if you guys are not up to date with the season, I would definitely recommend you update yourself before watching this podcast as I'm going to spoil things. Before we actually jump in, jump in. I am drinking a Maywood tea today and it's, as per usual, very delicious. Did I just say Mayweed or Maywood? Mayweed? I'm drinking a Mayweed tea. Did I say Maywood? I'm very tired. <laughs> I woke up at 5.30 in the morning. It is now 11 a.m. and I did not get enough sleep, but that's because, well, it just happens like that sometimes. Now, I did make a lot of notes for my Attack on Titan podcast, and I think I'm just going to follow it to the T, mostly because I'm tired and I might end up monologuing about something else. So if that happens, I'm sorry. But what I want to focus on is one, two, three, four, five specific components of Attack on Titan. We're going to review the whole series, not for its technicality, not for its world building, nothing more than what can we utilize in terms of the show as a metaphor for our own life, right? This is a channel that focuses on philosophy and introspection. And as I'm watching the show and as I just did an event on my VC on Discord, PS, join us through Patreon, support the work, we had a discussion about it. And for some people, it was about the world building. For other people, it was about the metaphor. I think for most of my audience, it's going to be about philosophy and metaphor. What does this anime say about my life? What lesson can I learn from it? Since Attack on Titan so mirrors the real world so perfectly. I think a lot of us could relate, especially with conflicts happening around the world right now. It's pretty clear the us versus them narrative is always a failing of the human species. And in this series, I think Aaron, who was this sort of lovable protagonist for some of us, maybe hateable for others, turned out to be different than we perceived him to be. And so Aaron is sort of, and I categorized everyone as a representation as a whole, right? Don't take this too literal, but think of what they represent. So I wrote down, Aaron Yeager represents humanity's failure to introspect. I feel like as we perceive Aaron throughout the series, we're, sp we're supposed to see him as this like great protagonist who's playing 4D chess, when in reality, he's just like a 19-year-old kid who's severely struggling with the immense burden of his responsibility that he feels obligated to fulfill. And the question of whether or not he's actually obligated to fulfill it is sort of, again, maybe the world building doesn't allow him his free will. Maybe it's a conversation about determinism. Maybe we can learn or at least take at least we can compare it with our own life in regards to how we make choices. I think that's probably the best way to consume Aaron is if I was Aaron, would I know how to stop the rumbling? If I was Aaron, would I know not to destroy 80% of the planet? If I was Aaron, would I have made a different decision? Aaron feels almost like a, like a puppet on a string for Amir. He feels, at least the way he's narrated in the very last episode, trapped by his own sense of any – any way he quote unquote looked at it, it had to end up this way. And I think for some people, like they are who they are and that is what life is going to be. If we really looked at Aaron's life and sort of thought about our own, maybe we do feel trapped. Maybe we do feel obligated to be a puppet of somebody else. Maybe we do feel trapped in a bubble and like we can't leave it. It's interesting if you think about Aaron and his desire to see the ocean or leave the walls or see anything other than his home. Once given the opportunity, it doesn't matter. And I think that happens a lot on my channel. We talk a lot about popping bubbles and we talk a lot about how people can travel the world. They can see places around the world. They can see different cultures and see different people and it's not going to make that much of a difference. They can pop a bubble, but not pop a bubble. Everyone lives in a bubble, myself included. I just made mine. Aaron feels trapped by his. The whole time in the series, I'm thinking, oh, Aaron's playing 4D chess. He's getting himself out of it. He's making a different decision. He's holding on to his agency. But no, that's not really what's happening, right? And I feel like society, humanity, when I made my original levels of introspection video, links down below if you don't know my number system, and I said most of the planet were twos, it's not to insult humanity. It's to be observant about how they're experiencing reality. If you're beholden to your ethnicity, your race, your gender, your culture, if you're beholden to hating somebody just because they were born in a different place than you, then you are sort of beholden to this 
this construct of a bubble. And Aaron and all all of Attack on Titan characters are subjected to this like obligation to hate people for who they are. And obviously they represent a lot of what happens in a, in our reality, right? It's written by a person in our reality. And then we're supposed to jump into this magical land where there's these things called Titans, right? And what do Titans represent, right? So I wrote Titans represent humanity's greatest enemy, which is themselves. Like humanity's greatest enemy is ourselves, but also we have to radically accept that this is the cycle we live in. We live in a cycle of humanity. Hobodesties, my allergies have been so bad today. Oh my gosh. Also, I just realized I forgot to turn on my candles. So much for ambiance. <laughs> I'm so tired. Okay. One of the things that I think stands out to me is that by the end of the series, if you guys watch the credits, the after credits, it's clear that like humans repeat history. It's not that history repeats itself. It's that we repeat history, which coincides with the work that I've been working on. And again, I'm not claiming to be some amazing wise human. I think I'll die unwise. But it's obvious to me that human beings are lacking introspection and lacking the wisdom to not murder each other, to not cause harm. Even when we say like, I have an like a great amount of empathy. I'm an empath. We still make fun of people. We still bring people down. We're still mean to people. Even though the world is mostly people who have empathy, we still go to war. We still destroy each other. Even recently with the conflicts in the Middle East, we had very public figures say things like give them hell, destroy them, take them out. And it doesn't matter what side you're on. It doesn't matter who you are. You're still advocating for the murder of like thousands of people, mostly civilians, which is like your right to feel that passionate about protecting yourself because that's what it is. The road to hell is paved in good intentions and Attack on Titan is like the epitome of fear controlling a populace. I'm so afraid of you. I don't even trust myself to 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 trust you. At the particular part in the series, the very end when um, Armin – kills Aaron, which obviously we know it's Mikasa, he comes to the people and says like, we're no longer Titans, you can trust us. And the people, even though they just worked with them, even though Annie's dad and the the car, the military guy was work, where they were working together, there was still like a distrust. Humanity has a distrust in one another because we know there's like some sort of very biological urge to protect ourselves. But the dilemma is that I think we need to appeal to our higher thinking self, a version of ourself that truly humanizes and empathizes with people, but also radically accepts that like we're all trapped in little bubbles with belief systems and we're not willing to pop those bubbles because we'd have to remake our consciousness. Aaron would have to face himself and really dig deep about who he is and the decisions he's made, I think, to pop out of that bubble of Amir stronghold. Or maybe if you're like more lenient towards Amir, you could say she's also a victim of her toxicity and codependency and sort of love for the king, which brings on this 2000 year old curse and maybe Amir stuck in this bubble and she can't get out of the cycle. And so she has to have this relationship with Aaron where they kind of help each other in sort of a symbiotic way, fight their fears to release themselves. But the release is death for both of them. And then the irony of it, of course, is if you go to the end credits, the cycles continue for generations to the point again where the alleged hint at the end was that the boy walked into a tree made of air and spirit, which we assume will also bring the Titans back because humans repeat history. So again, when we're asking ourselves, like, are we stuck in a bubble? Are we all twos? Like, are we stra- like, trapped in these? We're not trapped in anything more than our unwillingness to engage with thinking that we don't know. So much of Attack on Titan, Zeke's desire to do the euthanasia plan, Aaron's desire to wipe out humanity, everyone is banking on them knowing what's best for 8 billion people, which is always the mistake I see in our reality is people are so sure they know what's right for people. You'll have people like Andrew Tate say, if more men were like me, the world would be better. You'll have people with religion, religious beliefs, right? If the world was like my religion, the world would be better. And yes, people like you would have a better life, but people unlike you would have a worse off life. And so again, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. You obviously have good intentions mostly, but also your good intentions are wrapped in your ego and your narcissism, which we see displayed in this show. Like again, 
I don't think anyone in Attack on Titan was displaying great introspection. I don't think there was anyone who gave us an opportunity to not be violent. I think in so many ways, they also didn't have the privilege, let's use that word, where they didn't have the time. They were so in survival mode. They were so on on that they didn't even have time to think, what if I just was someone different? What if I did something different with my life? And I don't think that they allowed themselves to think they could. Now, that's really common. Most of us are born into cultures and bubbles and we have expectations our parents put on us, work puts on us, school puts on us, dating puts on us. And then you can decide to engage with it or not, right? But that's up to you and how you want to perceive reality and how you want to have a relationship with it. Now, for myself, I think like we're evolved animals over time. I don't think human beings are much different than anything else living on the planet. But I think our uniqueness allows us to have this conversation here. Look at me. I'm a YouTuber, right? I'm like having a conversation about an art piece somebody else made on the other side of the world and like, okay, cool. But ultimately, I think when we give in to our fears, we choose violence. And when we give in to our introspection, we find peace. I think like joy is kind of the goal, not just happiness, which is too easy, but joy, which is why when you find like money and materialism and it makes you happy, it's temporary because you're not finding your actual joy. So when you find joy, you're furthest away from evil. When you find evil, you're furthest away from joy, which I think was displayed within um, the story of Attack on Titan, right? The closer everybody was to sort of evil, the less joyful they were, which tore up the world. And the more that we they found their joy by letting go of their attachments, the more they came closer to joy. So there's one section here where I wrote down the friends and what they represent. They represent the bubbles coming together. All of the friends at the very end who fight Aaron, all of them, right? Um, from Rainer to um, Gabby to Armin to Mikasa, everyone coming together, Jean and Connie, everyone coming together is all of the bubbles, right, from both sides, but also different people coming together to let go of their attachment of Aaron, which I think represents the attachment to the military obligation, the bubble obligation, their family, the obligation to hate each other and to fight each other. In so many ways, Aaron as a character became the sort of sacrificial lamb to tell a story about a group of people that needed to detach themselves from what was holding them back, which was like their attachment to their identities. So much of our identity is so key to who we are. I think it's really, really important, especially on the micro. But on the macro, like we're all a part of the universe, not to get too woo woo, but we are just kind of like people figuring out our lives and going about our day. And we spend so much time hating people and separating people because of identity. And I understand that when the world is ending, it's easy to forget all of the nuanced ways we don't like each other down to the way people chew. But ultimately, what I think happens when you give into fear is you do choose violence and you move away from joy because you're attached to this fear, right? So they let go of a fear of letting go of their friend. They let go of the fear of even losing. I love the part where Jean and Connie were like holding each other as they turned into Titans at the very end. What a beautiful like detachment. What a beautiful letting go. So again, we have Aaron who represents humanity's lack of um, introspection. Um, the Titans who represent our greatest, you know, enemy, Amir who represents like trauma and toxicity and not breaking generational curses, the friends who represent the bubbles, right? And then Aaron's destroying of 80% of the population is sort of like a quote unquote wet dream of sort of edgelords on the internet. People will say like, oh, humanity would be better if we just wiped out 80% of it so we could start again. This fantasy that if we just had less people or if humans, you know, just sort of like dissipated in numbers, the world would be better. Maybe for a time. I think what Aaron gives humanity is like a band aid, it's a cope, right? Because even after he dies, his friends end up becoming like basically politicians or diplomats or activists, depending on how you want to have that relationship with their role. But they don't even get to live their life, they get to spend it still justifying their right to exist. It's exhausting. So the fantasy in our mind should be that like there's peace. It's like a Ghibli film where we're all relaxing in a field of grass. But instead, I think Attack on Titan forces you to humble yourself and realize like humans will repeat history and the cycle continues. And Aaron destroying 80% of the population led to just a postponement of the cycle. The cycle continues. We go to war. We nuke. We destroy. We hate. We separate. We, you know. 
And it, it just goes in circles and circles and circles. When we review things on my channel, we talk about like taking Jordan Peterson as an example. Like we just watched him on a podcast where he seemed obviously better, but was still so focused on hating on people who focus on their identities, right? And he says, your identity isn't everything. You need to have a kid, have a family, have something bigger outside of yourself. I think for some people, yes, you should have something bigger outside of yourself, like a community or, a, you know, think about church or school or whatever you're doing with your life. But for a lot of people, it's about research and meditation and isolation. It's about doing no harm. Because remember, the more invested you are in other people's lives, the more you build an ego around how you help people, and then you become Zeke. People will forget that if you keep living for other people, you will also live for their identities and their bubbles and their beliefs and their goals. And the question is, if we all ask ourselves what are our individual goals, I think most people just want to be satisfied. I think most individuals want to be satisfied. It's societies that come together, mobs of people that come together that I think end up becoming much more corrupt than the individual who just wants to be left alone. Now, again, this is my fantasy land as in my bias as an individual person. I obviously want to be left alone. I don't want to move towards violence. I don't want to discriminate against you because of your identity. I want to be left alone because my whole life has been fighting for my identity being, you know, my whole life feels like I've been validating myself and saying like, I deserve to be alive. I deserve to be here. Well, everyone's like, but do you? And again, like every minority has a story about this because when you're the minority, Minority and the majority looks at you funny. It's their relationship with you rooted in fear, right? And again, in order for me to radically accept that humans were going to human, which is like a big slogan on this channel, I had to be open with boundaries. I'm open to humanity, but I have my boundaries with it. And I feel like sometimes we get lost in the fear of like, they're coming for us. They're coming for us. Life itself is coming for you, but especially death. In the series, we talk, Zeke has that moment with Armin where he's kind of very nihilistic. And he's saying, like, what's the point? We're all going to die either now or later or whenever. Yeah, exactly. Why are we rushing it? And we rush it because of fear. We postpone it because of fear. Radically accepting your death is radically accepting your life. And sometimes in Attack on Titan, it felt like life and death were so fickle. And yet the most important thing ever. The way Aaron just smashed a bunch of people in the rumbling so his friends could live. He valued his friends' lives so much. He destroyed 80% of the planet. Probably more if they didn't stop him. He lacked the introspection to think that maybe other people had groups of friends as well. Maybe you could have done something different with your power. Maybe you could have been a different Aaron. Now, I know he says in the story, and maybe this is the world building part I refuse to accept, that he couldn't have been anyone but himself. Now, to be honest, we covered determinism and free will the other day on the channel. And there is a part of me that knows like Andrew Tate has to be Andrew Tate because he can't decide to be somebody else. Like Putin has to be Putin because he can't seem to choose to be anyone else. But I'm not stuck in that bubble. I feel like I have a great relationship with free will and I can understand the differences between when I'm like, oh, in my little biology moment or when I'm like, oh, that's mental health. Or, oh, look at that decision I just made for no reason. But ultimately, I know I have free will and the capacity to engage with it by really focusing in on the present. In my present life, I want no violence. I want just peace. It's only when I start to fear about the future and life and death and other people in war and oh my gosh, is it that you start to panic. And I understand as I watch TikTok after TikTok and I see people very upset over the recent conflicts that are happening, even though these conflicts are happening all the time around the world at every moment. It's just right now this one is interesting to us. And that's the truth of it. If you zoom in, the conflict is always unjustified because there is no reason to slaughter so many people. But the fear feels justifiable from everybody. I have seen no dignity in any of the conflict that is truly, truly able to see everybody as human. It's always about making sure the person who is your enemy is less than you and you want everyone on your side because we all don't trust this person, right? And I think Attack on Titan forces us to see that, but whether or not you take the message from it in that way is up to you. If you want to keep looking at the world like everyone is your enemy, then everyone will be your enemy. 
And I understand from a biological perspective that makes a lot of sense to have tribes and communities and isolate other people from them and discriminate and all of this stuff is very quote unquote natural because everything humans produce is natural in my opinion, including nuclear weapons. But the question is, does humanity ever evolve, whether in this blip of history or another in the future, do we ever evolve to the point of not just adhering to our biology? Now, my theory, of course, is no, because we have for all of human history that we have access to repeated cycles and will continue to repeat those cycles, as was shown at the end credits of Attack on Titan, right? And because of this, I radically accept that in three generations, no one will remember me. In 100 years, my stuff will be someone else's stuff. And so it's my job right now to live peacefully and with harm reduction in mind as much as possible until the day that like death comes for me. And I will enjoy that with my husband and my cat, my family and my friends and you guys. But Attack on Titan forces us in some ways to radically accept that it doesn't matter if you wipe out 80% of the population. It doesn't matter if you save all your friends and family, they will die. And a new struggle will come about, a new war will come about. And so people will say, well, Brittany, then what's the point? Like Zeke does to Armin, what's the point? This is the point. The point is, overall, humans do get better. It's just on the micro, we still have to fight these battles. Every day someone has a new baby and that new baby has to go through its own struggle and its own identity crisis and its own like angst with the world and its own fear and its own desire to see the world end. I just watched Asmongold review an incel video. I was thinking about reviewing for my own channel where these incels are like, yeah, sometimes I blame women for it all. Like it's definitely their fault that I'm alone. Okay, sure. It's everyone else's fault that you're unjoyful. How easily we give our consciousness to the world. How easily we give our consciousness the one thing you actually have power over to somebody else. I love watching a world with angry people that are so upset at everybody else for making them angry. And I understand as somebody who's gone through therapy, as somebody who has childhood trauma, as somebody who has a personality disorder because of that trauma, I understand what it is to blame people. I know what it is to think you will never forgive anybody. But all I know is when I decided to own my life and own my consciousness and choose joy, everything fell into place. Humans became relatable again. People became, I don't know, it just became normal again to like, enjoy people you ever go through that angsty teen stage of like I hate everybody and no one's as cool as I am yeah we've all been 15 but that can brood into some ugly fear which can brood into some ugly violence because you're not being introspective you're being fearful so attack on titan gives us an opportunity to see what category of person we are again metaphorically are we the Aaron who's lacking introspection so we destroy everything around us in hopes to quote unquote do good. Are we a mirror who's, you know, having really like an intense struggle and in breaking a generational curse to such a point she tortures 2000 years worth of people just to basically get the help she needs in like the most destructive way possible, right? Over a boy, ma'am, are we the Titans? Are we actually accepting that humanity is our greatest enemy? And that we need to like, we need to take care of ourselves, not by destroying ourselves, but by finding peace, right? Because like, I remember when I first watched Attack on Titan, like everybody else, it wasn't clear that they were going to be humans. So I think for some people it was predictable. So to find out that they were just humans made them less scary. Because humans are not that scary. They're only scary when we forget that we're also capable and we are also human. For all of his annoyance, Dr. Jordan Peterson does have a lot of empathy and sympathy for, ironically enough, the Germans during World War II, like the Nazis. And I understand his desire to humanize them, even though he can't seem to humanize trans people, which is so ironic to me. But I think it's true that no matter where you are and what side of the war, you always think you're the good guy. And that's really dangerous. And that's what happens with Aaron. And that's what happens originally with the friend groups, right? We saw in the earlier seasons, the two friend groups, we saw who was secretly like, um, you know, we saw Rainer in our, our side of camp thinking he was a part of our people only to realize he was the armor Titan, right? Like we, we saw them come in, we saw them infiltrate, we saw 
we saw the betrayal only to end up teaming up at the end anyways, because ultimately, like, we're not different. We are all the same, right? But it's really hard for us to remember that. It's really hard for us to believe it. Look at if an incel can't fathom that women are struggling with romance as much as men are. Like as if uh, as if women don't identify as ugly women, as if women don't identify with struggles with their weight, as if women aren't out here struggling. You can read every statistic out there and still not understand how lonely women are just as much as men are. It's just manifesting differently. And that's the problem. It's not about like one to one numbers. It's about humanity suffering. And that's the irony that I think human beings like will always like amuse me like they can't figure that out. Or you'll watch people preach from their pulpits about how to be moral and ethic while behind closed doors are committing the greatest sins. Humans are going to human. This is what they're going to do. So again, on the macro, we can all agree like no one should do violence. No one should murder. But on the micro, we sure as hell justify it because that person is scary, but I'm not scary. But don't you understand to those people, you are scary? We're all scary to each other, right? So when you radically accept that like we're all human, you can work together no matter no matter the bubble, right? But ultimately, the irony of Attack on Titan and the irony of what I'm trying to tell you is like it doesn't matter how much I preach that. It doesn't matter how much. Sometimes you still got to take your best friend out because your best friend decides to destroy 80% of the planet. And then, okay, moving down. So you're the bubbles that come together against what? Against the person who justifies the violence for their sense of good. The road to hell is paved in good intentions. So history doesn't repeat itself. Humans repeat history. You know, when I watch anime, I'm not trying to watch it exactly for the world building. No offense to my world building people. I'm trying to say, what can I take? What tool is this anime trying to give me? When I watch Hunter x Hunter, when I watch Dragon Ball Z, when I watch Sailor Moon, when I watch any of the animes, I'm asking myself, like, what is the tool it's giving me? What am I supposed to learn from this? And ultimately, I think anime teaches us one specific thing about people, and that's people are going to people. Villains are villains some days and heroes are villains some days and villains are heroes other days and we all have ups and downs in life and we're not perfect, but we can absolutely get better, right? And it's not always going to be the same journey. It's not going to be always up to everyone's standard and it's certainly going to, it's not going to be perfect or it's not going to be easy, but it is possible. And I think that's really, really important for people to understand. Every time you decide to give up and you decide to give into fear and grief and all the negative emotions, not that you shouldn't feel them, you should definitely feel them, but you need to let go of that attachment. The only attachment you should have is to letting go of attachment. So you can be free of those obligations. But again, because we live in bubbles, because we have family and structure and community and consistency, because we need those things as humans and it's adaptive, as some people would say, it's really hard to let it go because to let it go is almost to go anti your nature, which I would argue is what evoking free will is. I would say free will is anti your biology because your biology does want you to tribe. It does want you to hate. It does want you to survive. It wants you to blend. It doesn't want you to be authentic. It doesn't want you to be unique. It doesn't want you to be any of those things, which is fair because, again, you're trying to survive. But what if you didn't have to worry about surviving anymore? What else could you do with your life? And I know that sounds privileged and a part of it is because you need the time to actually meditate to enough to do that, but it doesn't look the way you think it does. It doesn't just look like, oh, now I can pay my bills so I can meditate. It's about recognizing that the game you're playing with paying your bills, which is universal, is different for all of us. But, you know, paying your bills and getting a Bugatti is different. A lot of people will preach to you, get a Bugatti, become rich, get a private jet. No, no. Like you're literally giving yourself an attachment to something that is meaningless. It represents nothing. It represents nothing, right? But if you put value on it to represent something, it's going to be your ego. Accomplishment is ego-based. So when you're like, I'm going to get the Bugatti so people know I accomplished this, you're just worshiping your ego, which is fine, I'm not saying you're a bad person for being human and worshiping your ego, but be careful where it leads you. And that's the mistake I think Zeke was making. It's the mistake that Aaron was even making. But Aaron, it's the opposite of like a confident ego. It's insecure ego with Aaron and confident ego with Zeke. 
And then Zeke kind of has his moment where he kind of comes to right before Levi kills him, where he kind of almost has his moment. Now, that moment, I think, was popping a bubble. I'm not sure that he actually elevated himself to like a two or three or four or five. Like, I'm not sure. But he obviously was like a two who like popped a bubble and realized like, oh, I was missing the point. But also, you know, he didn't live long enough for for us to really see the, exactly the point he really came to. Funny enough, Levi killing him, I was kind of shocked about because I thought like, oh, maybe we're past it. But Levi needs to fulfill this part of his destiny, if you will, his what was determined for Levi. And so that for a moment made me wonder if Levi was even evoking his free will. I saw that more as Le- Levi's like autopilot, like he had to fulfill this thing. But I wonder if Levi had me- had time to meditate, the privilege of meditation. I wonder if he would have used wisdom to keep Zeke alive. I wonder if he would have seen the benefit to Zeke living. And that's something that stays with me as well is um, how little wisdom there is in anything that was done throughout the series. This isn't like Avatar The Last Airbender where you have like an Uncle Iroh character. I didn't, I felt like there was not any of the, no wisdom was represented in any of the characters. I'm not even sure there was like a metaphor for wisdom except like a lack of. And so for me, as I watch the series, I'm once again just like comforted with this idea that humans will go in cycles and we are just living history. Like right now we are living history. People will tell stories about this time. They will reference us as like, oh, the time when this happened. And now we have more than ever an opportunity to form our our destiny or to impact our destiny, to have the life we want. So it is always shocking to me when people choose violence because in some ways that's the life you chose. And in other ways, if you feel like it isn't a life you chose, then you're Aaron and you're lacking the desire to introspect or you're lacking the skills to introspect and you're trapped in a cycle of what Amir represents, which is like that generational curse. So again, you have to know who you are in the story to to be somebody else in the story. You have to know who you are in the story to be someone else in the story. We saw that with Mikasa as she was breaking her attachment to Aaron just enough to take his life. That was really, really important. Now, of course, the whole group kind of broke their attachment from Aaron while still at the very end having that attachment of his consciousness, knowing that he was a friend and they loved him. And technically, Mikasa did plant him as a tree, which then I assume kept Titans going by the way the end credits ended. So it was kind of ironic that Amir kept the curse going for 2,000 years and then Mikasa kept that curse going for another who knows how long. (sighs) women and their love, you know, but this show is a show about humans being human in the most human way. And it is a conversation between what is determined for you and like, do you have an opportunity to be someone different? And I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves more than anyone. When we choose violence, what is the justification we use to cause or support that violence? And does it really align with wisdom? And does it lead us to our joy or does it move us much closer to evil than we're even willing to admit? Those are my thoughts on Attack on Titan. I'd love to hear your thoughts because I'm sure I left out some stuff and I'd love to review it in the future. But personally, if you guys are interested in if I thought anyone was like a level five or anyone is like where they were on my – I honestly didn't feel like any of the characters were written as fives. I felt like the author might have been trying to tell a five story but maybe fell a little short or maybe was attempting it. I'm not really sure. It seems like he himself is struggling with the idea or writing about it. And I know it was a 10-year process. So I know he also felt the pressure to write a certain story. So I know there was a lot that went into it, but I didn't see from my observation any particular character that really represents that. If you're interested on my levels and learning more about it, please check out the video in the description because I use Avatar The Last Airbender to explain it. And I think I do it pretty well. But in Attack on Titan, I don't think I could explain the levels in Attack on Titan. I just feel like nobody represented it. No, there wasn't even a moment that represented it, right? So for me, I feel like everyone was basically a two trapped in their bubbles. And though they popped some bubbles and we saw that happen, they never popped enough to go to four or five. They just popped enough to be different kinds of twos. And ultimately, it's a good story about good people with good intentions and a lot of suffering. So basically the world, right? 
Okay, with that said, leave your comments down in the sections down below, and I will talk to you next week. Bye. In my head, in me life while I'm dead, my belly's being fed, and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking, yeah. I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun.